Today in Live on Live, we're looking at conflict minerals. So how are you listening to this broadcast? If you're doing it on a computer or your phone or even on your radio, you're almost certainly benefiting from minerals that make up the components of those devices. And those minerals, if they weren't mined responsible, responsibly, could be fueling wars and conflicts around the world. This week, the European Union has been debating a conflict mineral law. To talk about all of this, I'm joined by Emily Norton. She's with Global Witness, an NGO working on the link between natural resources and conflicts. She's been following this debate in the EU. Emily, welcome. Thank you. So let's start with definitions. Um, what's a conflict mineral? I think people may have heard of blood diamonds. Is, is it the same idea? Yeah, so conflict minerals, I think, good to start with that. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, conflict minerals are minerals mined in conflict-affected areas and high-risk areas where the trade in those minerals funds armed groups um, and fuels human rights abuses. Are, are, I mean, are, we, are this all minerals or are these really specific places? And where are we talking about? Very much depends on the minerals. So mm. there is a big range of minerals. Mm. We're not just talking about a handful. The EU is looking at a handful. But we're talking, for example, about tungsten, which makes up the vibrate. It causes the vibrations in your mobile phone. We're talking so is it about a metal, tungsten? Tungsten, exactly. Okay, it needs to be mined. And where do you find tungsten? So, for example, you find tungsten in countries in Africa like the Congo, but you also find tungsten in, in uh, South America. You also find tungsten in parts of Asia. And so these are, these are minerals that are mined and, and in some cases or in all cases are, are then maybe used to fund these conflicts. Exactly. It's not all cases, okay. of course, and it's not all parts of these countries at all. Um, it really depends on, it can be mine by mine, it can be region by region. Um, but what we've seen, for example, in the case of tin, tungsten, tantalum and gold, which are four, four minerals that the EU is looking at at the moment, um, the trade in those minerals is causing, it is fueling human rights abuses and is financing armed groups in countries like Colombia, in countries like the Central African Republic and Congo. Can we talk about sort of briefly how that works? They're funding armed groups, so the, the, I guess it's, it's, it's funneling off of the legal mining and going into the black market. How does that work? So what happens often is that armed groups, or in the case of Congo, for example, the members of the army will go in, take control of a mining area. They might tax the, the transportation routes. Um, they may use extortion payments. And what happens is that these minerals, um, as, you, as you're suggesting, the, the fund, it's, it's illegal. It's di being diverted away from the legal routes. Um, the money is going to the wrong places. And ultimately, this is, this is a global trade. So it's, it's, it's moving into global supply chains. And that's where the EU is significant. Right. It's moving into global supply chains because a lot of the, the devices we use use all these minerals or these, yeah. these things. And we, we don't have a choice if you want to make them the way we make them. Consumers don't have a choice right now because companies don't have a responsibility. Well, they, they have a responsibility, but they don't have a, a mandatory requirement to, right. to look down these supply chains. So consumers right now, I would agree, have very little choice about in the matter that it's difficult, you can ask the right questions, but it's up to the company to tell you what, what, what they're doing or not, because there is no law in the EU at the moment that expects companies to, to put in place the right right risk assessment and the right measures. Right. So there's not there's nothing at all. There's no law at all. There's a lot of talk, but but there's nothing in place right now. Companies do what they want. Right now, companies do what they want, and that's different to other places. So the U.S. already has a mandatory law on this issue. China is actually already putting in place in industry standards that they've just published mm -hmm. um, in line with we do have a global standard on this issue. Um, the EU is at risk of really lagging behind but is discussing a law at the moment. Um, why, why is the EU so behind? The EU, uh, well, uh, uh, given the current... Uh, the, the, where we are at the moment is that the EU is negotiating a law, and so arguably is going to be, could be leading on this issue. So I don't want to say the EU is definitely sure. going to be behind. Um, but, but there's the been, EU there's so been a far, bit of criticism of what the EU is proposing. There's been a lot of crit criticism. And so far what's happened is that we've had um, the, basically the negotiations between the, the three institutions in the EU have just started to finalise a law. But what we've seen is that governments are, are really stepping away from, from what we would expect. They're putting something forward that would be totally voluntary. Um, EU governments are sort of supporting something that would affect 300 companies, which is nothing in the EU, and that would actually fall below international standards. So we are, when you when you say why, I mean it's it's really when you it very stark contrast when you look at the rhetoric coming out of the EU, coming out of P President Hollande, support for human rights, support for responsible supply chains, and on this mineral sector issue, on when we're looking at. Um, 
uh, companies' responsibility along their own supply chains, there's a real, there's just a real, they're really falling behind. And, and that's why, I mean, I, I imagine that here we're getting into these sort of economic interests versus rights interests, mm -hmm. and they should intersect. But mm -hmm. I imagine, I guess maybe the first question would be, what's an ideal law? Like, ideally, what happens? You're talking about supply chains, but, for, mm. you know, how, how does it work to make sure that the tungsten I get in my phone is is not fueling war in Congo? Yeah, we want to see, um, um, Global Witness is part of um, a, a large coalition of NGOs, mm -hmm. over 80. Um, we want to see a mandatory law. Voluntary standards have been in place for a long sure. time. Doesn't work. So we have the mandatory versus voluntary. Mandatory but what versus would that law voluntary. Be? And that law would look at, basically, there are international standards at the moment that ask companies and expect companies that to put in place measures to look down their supply chain, see if there's a risk that they might fund conflict, they might fund an armed group, and do something about it and start asking the right questions. So it's, it's very much a, about changing the way businesses work so that they ask questions and look down their supply chain. But how do we how do we connect, say, you know, the company based in, I don't know, France mm. or Germany with the corrupt army official in the mine in the Congo? Like, how does how does that work on a practical level? Yeah, very practically. No, it's a good question because there's a lot of misunderstanding, actually, about how some of these companies, what they're expected to do. But if you're a manufacturer of mobile phones in France, you are not expected to go right down to the mine level, work out where, where the minerals in your products are coming from, and to, to go to that minute detail. The, the standards that we're talking about, which again, it's this global standard that we want to see in place in a mandatory law, that standard asks those companies simply to look at, at certain suppliers in their supply chain and to see what those suppliers are doing to assess these risks. So it's like an information flow along the supply chain. It's very much, for example, like anti-money laundering, terrorist financing. Okay. How There's about the clothing industry, sort of? You have that sometimes of, of, of responsible clothing, finding out if it's made in a Bangladesh factory with child labor or not. It's exactly. The same idea. These are all examples of where governments actually um, and, and companies are making steps to look down their supply chain. There's a, there's a lot of cases, actually, of mandatory laws in other sectors. Mm -hmm. Food law, we look down our food supply chains. Again, I mentioned money laundering, terrorist financing, bribery in the UK. These, all of these laws ask companies to look down their supply chain and deal with risks and, and be transparent about what they're doing. We don't have that yet along with the minerals, minerals supply chains. So, so the issue in Europe, it appears then, is this idea of voluntary versus mandatory. You're saying it should be mandatory. Um, and the, the, who's blo what's blocking the, the idea? I mean, it's, it's lobbying business interests or is it actually governments worried about their economic uh, stability? I think it's it's an, um, a difficult time f to be pushing this sort of law. Arguably, governments, you know, there, there is an anti-regulation priority in the EU at the moment. Um, politically, it's a, it's a difficult time to be to be trying to regulate companies. But ultimately, this is an, a question of priorities. And if mm. you look at some of the, I mentioned the stark difference between some of the rhetoric in the EU, we've just seen in recent weeks so much discussion about the impact of conflict, so much discussion, President Hollande as well, talking about the impact of conflict. And yet this is a case of the government's potentially about to miss a huge opportunity to put in place a law that would actually help reduce and, and help tackle a trade that is Fueling conflict, fueling conflict, and fueling so corruption. They, you're saying they should take abuses. advantage of this. Yeah. Exactly. One thing, though, you look at, for example, the law in the United States, mandatory law, yeah. I believe. Um, so you have a law in place. Of course, then there's enforcement of that law. Not yeah. always possible. Uh, and what are the issues there? Obviously, you need the law first and then deal with enforcement. Yeah. But there's some there's some issues with that. Yeah, I think when it comes to enforcement, I mean, the U.S. law is actually very different in, mm. in some ways to this, this okay. EU law. So I don't want to draw, to draw too many parallels. But if we're talking about enforcement in the EU, sure, absolutely, um, that, that is a factor to consider in any law. Um, but I don't think it's uh, I don't think that is uh, the the fact that this law needs to be enforced should be a reason not to have the law in place. There are plenty of other laws, what we call due diligence laws. So laws that ask companies to do this sort of process in their supply chain to be responsible. Mm. Um, we would not be expecting and the law would not expect the member states to check every single company. They would take a risk, what we call a risk based a risk, yeah. approach. That, so they sample. would look at mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -mm. Um, yeah. So, so that that's the ideal. We'll we'll see how it develops. I'm, yeah. On a, on a concrete level, and you sort of mentioned this before, but any individual user consumer at this point, before a law comes in, what would you suggest quickly? What what, what should you do when you're about to buy a phone? Don't buy the phone. I would say ask the questions. <laughs> ask the questions of the company. Um, ask them what it, do they have a conflict minerals policy? Because actually, as a result again of as a result of mandatory law in the U.S. 
a lot of companies will, in the US case, have, have conflict minerals policies. Companies that actually supply to US companies mm -hmm. should have these conflict minerals policies. Ask them what they're doing. And also, it just in terms of other campaigning and other, other things citizens can do is to talk to your representatives in right. parliament. It's sort of a lobbying on a citizen yeah. level, absolutely. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much. You are Emily Norton with Global Witness. This is an NGO working on the link between natural resources and conflicts. Thank you thank for you. being our guest on RFI.